Wow. Well, thank you, Eliza. That was a tiny bit embarrassing, and I think Claudia is now going to kill me, but <laughs> that's okay. And thank you, Sebastian. Um, I also want to start with some thank yous. First, to the Academy and everyone who has passed through these doors in the last 28 months. This has been an extraordinary experience, one of sharing ideas, of learning new things, of being part of an exceptional institution and community. Is the microphone? Yes. Um, it's been a pleasure and an inspiration to work with the American Academy staff, whose dedication and passion for this place and its mission is remarkable. Um, a huge thank you to Eliza for her incredible energy, passion, and commitment. To Ann Coulson, who really holds everything together. Uh, we'd be lost without Ann, I think. And to Julia Bada and Sophia Ekman, who I've worked closely with and who have been absolute pleasures to organize walks and talks and to travel with. And if it weren't for Julia and Sophia's logistical skills, I would probably still be wandering around Siena or Taranto looking for the bus. So uh, they, they are absolutely wonderful. And then to Lexi Eppersbacher, Laura, Laura Cabezas, Tina Canchemi, Ilaria Puri Purini, whose team spirit has made working together here in the Cryptoporticus uh, great fun. In all, as Elisa said, between 1987 and today, I've spent more than five years of my life at the American Academy. I do want to say when I came in 1987, I was 12. Uh, I, was on, I was on the middle school <laughs> fellowship. Um, I've been here as a fellow, a visiting scholar, and you know, now as a Mellon professor. And it has been a gift that has shaped my work and my life, and a gift for which I am very grateful. Um, and from thank yous, I am going to jump into talking about fascism and conspiracy theories. Um, a, bit, a bit of shift in, in mood. As all of us who've lived through the last few years know, views of the world steeped in conspiracy theories have come to dominate contemporary political culture. There's been a marked resurgence of discourses detailing the threat of existential enemies and their conspiracies. One need only think of QAnon or some of the responses to the COVID pandemic. Certainly the internet, political polarization, the global rise of authoritarianism have fomented conspiratorial thinking and the attendant notion that the nation is besieged by evil forces, both internal and external. An environment of generalized anxiety over the future, be it around the climate crisis or global scarcity accelerates the circulation as well as the attraction of conspiratorial worldviews. That said, conspiratorial explanations of how, who, and what controls the world, and that that control is hidden and has nefarious ends, have existed and shaped politics for centuries. One can trace visual, structural, and rhetorical commonalities among conspiratorial discourses going back centuries. Among the most well-known, probably familiar to many, pe many people here, uh, among the conspiracy myths was that of the blood libel, which accused Jewish communities across Europe of stealing Christian children and draining their blood for use in religious rituals, which first appeared in the medieval period. And then we can think as well of the moment of conspiratorial hysteria around the Salem witch trials of 1692 and 1693. So without a doubt, conspiracy myths tend to emerge and hold greatest power in times of crisis, times of uncertainty and dislocation, periods of anxiety about the future, such as that which gripped America during the Red Scare, um, are especially productive of conspiracy theories. Inexplicable or complex phenomenon, such as the plague in the medieval and early modern period, or again, our recent COVID pandemic are available for easy manipulation and for the channeling of anxiety into narratives which concentrate blame on a single group. According to most conspiracy myths, if the plotting and dangerous group and its plan are exposed to the light of day, the threat can be resolved. But conspiracy narratives are unstable as they circulate and transform, taking on shifting characteristics as they move from one location to another. Uh, 
they can be orchestrated from above or from below. And by below, I mean these sort of conspiracy theories that, you know, contemporary ones that sort of emerge without a distinct or traceable origin. Those from above, which is what my focus is on today, gener are generally used to take and maintain power. So in contrast to conspiracy theories emerging from multiple or diffuse sources, conspiracy narratives produced by those in power, as Paul Hannabrook has written in his study, A Spectre Haunting Europe, those become tools to mobilize and incite violence. In fact, conspiracy narratives are most dangerous when deliberately and tactically promoted by those in power, because they can be easily used to forge mass hysteria, mass fear, and the collective dehumanization of an internal or external enemy. This is a crucial tool for authoritarian governments or regimes, and even more so when they are at war and, and in need of a mobilized and fearful population. So today I'm going to talk about the mobilization and instrumentalization of conspiracy narratives promoted by the Italian fascist regime. And my focus is on two historical moments. First, uh, Italian Partic fascist participation in the Spanish Civil War from 1936 to 1939, and then second, during World War II and the campaigns against the Soviet Union. No, I knew I was going to do something <laughs> with the technology. Okay. No, 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 I wanted to go on. Okay. Um, with its, with, with its military intervention in support of the Franco-led insurgency in Spain, the Italian fascist regime pivoted its attention from a domestic political enemy as the, plot, as the force plotting to destroy Italy, being Italian socialists and communists, towards an existential external threat which it declared was scheming for world domination, global communism coordinated by the Soviet Union. So from the summer of 1936 forward, a, bar a barbaric civilization-destroying communist enemy, then fighting in Spain, but poised for and planning universal destruction, stood at the heart of multiple fascist conspiracy theories. The anti-communist, anti-socialist conspiracy myths from which Italian fascism drew were by no means new, but rather date from the emergence of socialism in the 19th century and accelerated to a fevered pitch in the wake of the Bolshevik Revolution. At the center of the post-World War I crisis in Europe, the Bolshevik Revolution served as a catalyst for the division of Europe between forces of order and counter-revolution and forces of revolution and radical restructuring. So into that maelstrom, especially in the successor and new states of Eastern Europe, Poland, Hungary, and Romania, anti-Bolshevism, often forged to Judeo-Bolshevism, drove the politics of both the center and the right. And Judeo-Bolshevism, uh, about which I'll talk more later, was the conspiracy discourse that Bolshevism was a Jewish plot and that all communists were Jews and all Jews were communists, and that when a communist was not Jewish, they were being directed by, by Jews. Um, so conspiracy theories around communism and its supposed well-planned and relentless pursuit of mass death and destruction circulated transnationally in the interwar period, spread by a range of groups deeply threatened by the social, economic, and political revolution proposed by communism. The producers of and supporters of fervent anti-communist politics were powerful and determined, uh, if unstable, a coalition of right-wing nationalists, conservatives, Catholics, emergent fascists, exiles from Russia, and monarchists from across Europe. Terrified by the communist revolutions in Munich, Berlin, and Budapest, this coalition forged a transnational crusade against communism. And by way of example and the larger context, this is a Hungarian anti-communist poster uh, following the Hungarian, uh, revo the Budapest Revolution of 1919. And here, we already see the themes about a sort of bloodthirsty communist, not fully human, um, that will become central to conspiracy theories under fascism. So while anti-communism and the conspiracy myths swirling around it 
drove the political and military battles of the interwar period, each national case had its own character. Um, in the Italian fascist case, anti-communist conspiracy theories drew on a number of sources, national well as, as well as international, religious, as well as secular conspiracy myths. With the declaration of a global communist menace in Spain in 1936, fascist ideology and culture reanimated and took in new directions its defeated domestic enemy of the 1920s. The leftist enemy had stood at the center of the fascist seizure of power offered by the fascist movement as the, as the force that had to be destroyed in order to save the nation. And destroy it they did through a violent crusade of vigilante black shirt violence. With the Spanish Civil War, the fascist regime put forward the theory that the democratically elected Spanish Republic, uh, attacked by the insurgent forces of General Franco in alliance with Nazi Germany and fascist Italy, was actually a false front for a brutal communist plot orchestrated from Moscow to subvert globe, the global moral, social, and religious order. This conspiracy myth, myth held that communism had infiltrated Spain with a clear blueprint to annihilate the church and its followers, to obliterate existing social and sexual codes, and replace them with anarchy, gender inversion, and sexual promiscuity. This theory held that the communists had come to Spain to burn churches, torture and murder the clergy, and drive the faithful into states of mortal sin or to their death. In this core element of fascist conspiracy narratives, uh, drawing on medieval texts about the devil intent on destroying the Christian world and jeopardizing the souls and bodies of the faithful, uh, the communists become shape-shifting devils. So my point would be they draw from very familiar uh, medieval texts and discourses. This language of the disguised devil plotting against uh, the church would have been familiar to the Italian public in the 1930s and would have tapped into deep feelings around safety and danger and fears over eternal damnation. The conspiracy narr narrative also uh, attributed, to the attributed the communist plot to subjugate uh, to, excuse me, attributed the communist plot to subjugation to a Russian Slavic Asiatic lack of civilization playing on centuries old ideas about racially other hordes coming from the East to threaten Western civilization. So in this part of the discourse, the communists were bent on destruction because of their ideological drive for barbarism, chaos, and violence. But as I noted, none of this was solely an Italian fascist ide ideology or set of uh, discourses. Rather, by 1936, the fascist regime produced most of its, much of its propaganda uh, influenced by that coming out of other fascists, coming out of Nazi Germany and a range of authoritarian nations. Anti-communism and the argument that the Axis fought to rescue Europe from Soviet enslavement was increasingly the glue of the Axis alliance. Combining recent and long-term elements of European Catholic, anti-socialist, and anti-Semitic conspiratorial thinking, the fascist regime declared it was joining a crusade to save civilization itself. As in all enemy characterizations, and there are a lot of universals here, uh, this one depended on the friend-enemy binary. The friends were Catholic Spain, Italy's Latin brothers, and the enemies were the godless, bloodthirsty, racially other alien rabble. Government uh, propaganda detailing a communist plot in Spain began at the very start of the Spanish Civil War in the summer of 1936 with Instituto Luce newsreels, which were screened before the showing of every feature film in Italy. And this is a screenshot from one of those uh, newsreels. So behind the newsreels established the representations uh, that can, are consistent through the war, constructing the strength, the purity, and purpose. of nationalist Spain and the chaos and illegitimacy of the republic. 
The othering and dehumanizing of the Republic began immediately in these newsreels by referring to the legally elected government of Republican Spain only as Irosi, as the Reds, or the Marxisti, or the Senzadillo, the godless. Uh, this is from a Luce newsreel of August 19, 1936, which in its opening words declared it was narrating the battle for true Spain against the Reds who have already brought Barcelona to rubble. Diegetic edits between the mob-like Republican crowds in disheveled civilian clothes with raised fists on the one hand, um, and, the gender, and the orderly gender-segregated nationalists visually conveyed messages about safety and danger. Republican forces and their supporters are presented as violent, angry, mixed gender rabble, while the nationalists march with discipline and calm, accompanied to the gates of the city in an all, with a women's auxiliary dressed in all white uniforms. In constructing the conspiracy narrative around communism, clean middle-class clothing and gender segregation become signifiers of social order, while working class clothing, beards, disheveled or dirty clothing become markers of gender and sexual disorder. By 1937, all Italian coverage of the war from the Istituto Luce newsreels to feature films to daily newspapers and illustrated magazines referred to the coalition and government of the Spanish Republic only as the Reds or the Senza Dio. Daily newspaper coverage cemented these key terms um, um, I want to say a little bit about the two leading newspapers of the time, Il Popolo d'Italia, the official newspaper of the fascist party, and Corriere della Sera, Italy's oldest and most wi widely read national paper. Press coverage from March 1937 draws our attention to the relationship between naming and dehumanizing. Between March 1st and March 30th, 1937, Il Popolo d'Italia used the term Rossi Rosa Rosa 210 times, Bolsheviki 11 times, Comunisti 18 times, Marxisti 18 times, again to represent the coalition government that was not necessarily dominated by the communists. And then this is mirrored in Corriere della Sera with a reference 267 times to the Reds. Why focus on March 1937? Um, March 1937 offers insights into the relationship between a losing battle and the escalation and intensity of conspiracy theories. March 1937 was the month that Italian for forces fought. Uh, this is from the Domenica della Corriere, just an example of the kind of headlines using the term reds. Um, so March 1937 was the month that Italian fought, forces fought and lost the Battle of Guadalajara, the largest engagement of Italian troops in the Spanish Civil War. Um, fascist and nationalist, Spanish nationalist forces attempted a pincer movement that month to capture Madrid. In the end, the Italian uh, Corps core of Voluntary Troops lost more than 3,000 soldiers to the combined Republican Army and the International Brigades. Above all, the Battle of Guadalajara was a humiliation for Mussolini and those fascist leaders who desperately wanted uh, to demonstrate the strength of the Italian military to their emerging ally Nazi, ally Nazi Germany. And just here's a map of showing the state of the war in 1937. The Battle of Guadalajara and its attendant losses unleashed a barrage of widely circulated and recirculated reports of red crimes against the church, its clergy, its faithful, and its sacred objects. These are Italian troops in Spain. And here um, are a series of book covers from the period. Uh, by 1937, soldiers' diaries, journalists' accounts, plays, feature films, and the like repeated the conspiracy narratives with escalating urgency for the public at home. 
reports and testimonies detailing burning churches, smashed, smashed, smashed religious objects, um, and the murder of priests circulated across Italy. And as in all conspiracy myths, the veracity of the reports or the integrity of the reporters was irrelevant. The reception and mass circulation in multiple forms of media of such images confirmed the need for a crusade and the idea that if this enemy were not stopped in Spain, it would conquer the world. And here uh, we have a book, and then I, it's not very clear, but images of destroyed churches. Whether published by the government uh, church publishing houses or general market publisher, the war in Spain was presented as a holy crusade. To quote one soldier's memoir, it was a crusade against the godless foreign reds for the liberty of noble Spain. It was an existential battle. Spain was be besieged by those forcing um, devout Catholics into a foreign moral code, and Italy had come to save them. The popular account Spagna in sang and Sanguinata, Bloody Spain, describe the struggle this way. The Reds have, have demonstrated how well they might realize their gruesome dream. The Christian martyrology has been written in Spain and now qualifies as one of the great chapters in our long and painful history. On March 21st, 1937, Il Popolo d'Italia ran an article entitled Orgies by Militiamen in a village church. According to this report, filed in the wake of the Italian defeat at Guadalajara, quote, there is hardly a single family that has not lost one of its members, who the Reds took the front under the threat of death to serve as cannon, cannon fodder. In one village, the communists transformed the church into a stable, violating the tombs and organizing orgies during which they indulged in the most abject atrocities towards the inhabitants. In another village, the communists held a bullfight, forcing the local priest to play the part of the bull. Then they stabbed this unfortunate man, dragging him seriously injured towards a field where the most atrocious tortures were inflicted on him. And we can imagine the impact of this kind of language as it's being reinforced in all directions. Now, while there were significant and militant anti-clerical sentiments among many on the Republican side, it is important to note that reports of widespread murder and torture of clergy were never substantiated, and that damages to churches happened in the battles caused both by the nationalists and the loyalists. Um, a visual imaginary accompanied the written descriptions of the conspiracy against the church in Spain. Photos of destroyed churches, smashed religious statues and objects circulated on postcards, pamphlets, as well as in murals and paintings. And here uh, we have from the Casa de Madre di Mutilati here in Rome, a fresco by Antonio Santa Attica, one of the regime's sort of major war painters. And you can see here the sort of rubble uh, of a destroyed church but what's really important to note, and is a little hard to see, is the hammer and sickle on uh, sort of the broken statue of the baby Jesus, and the graffiti, I don't know if people can see the FAI, for the Federación Anarquica Ibérica, the Spanish Anarchist Federation. Marking and graffiti is a theme through all of this uh, conspiracy theory. The idea that the communists had come not only to kill, but to sort of leave their polluting mark. Um, here, so, then this is an image in the book, Spagna in Sing Sanguinata, and again, the, the accusation of needing to mark and pollute religious objects. Even the futurists got involved in this visual imaginary. They took up the cause. And a shout out to Julia Beatrice, who shared this image uh, with me. This is the Spanish War. And again, it's hard to see, but so this is an Ero Pitura. The futurists at this point were very interested in depicting war from the air. So we have the crucifixion at the center and then somebody being executed tied to a pole. And there is a hammer and sickle below the crucifixion. 
Uh, it's very hard to see, but you can see the mass graves and the like. Um, during the Spanish Civil War, fascist, fascist Italy uh, moved race ideology to the center of its politics. First, during the occupation uh, of Ethiopia and coming in 1936 with the first racial laws against miscegenation in the empire, and then in July 1938 with the declaration, the, Man the racial manifesto, and then in November with the racial laws. With this, the conspiracy narratives took on a racial component. A number of obvious and well-known factors produced this shift, the presence of Nazi race ideology, but also elements in the fascist regime eager to promote a race ideology that drew from colonialism, eugenics, and homegrown anti-Semitism. So um, factions within the fascist hierarchy put forward and stress the need for a racial biological interpretation for the nexus between Jews and communists. It also argued that for the connection between communists and Jews as lower races, combining with this longstanding anti-Slav ideas as well as anti-Semitism. Dichotomies such as polluted and pure associated with racial categorization began to appear in the language around the war. Curzio Malaparte, this complicated and famous writer of the period, uh, described the fall of Madrid this way. Already the nationalists are, are in Madrid. The war in Spain is over. The Mongolian pseudo ideology that tried to pollute that most pure Latin civilization has been pushed back and destroyed. Successful conspiracy myths require absorption into the larger public. So the cross-fertilization of the same set of ideas through multiple media, as we have seen, accelerate the acceptance of the myth and lend it veracity. Conspiracy ideas are further reinforced when they are circulated from above and below. I want to talk now about the production uh, from below, and when by I say below, from the larger population. Pia Alberti's The Spanish Martyr, a play for women in three acts, which I have the cover, uh, the document from the archive here, uh, is an example of this. Alberti submitted the play to the theater censorship office of the Ministry for Press and Propaganda, and it was approved for production in 1937. Alberti was a school teacher with little known political connections, but she was moved to write this play. The Spanish martyr gives theatrical form to the myth that the Spanish Republic was led by the devil himself. In Alberti's theatrical rendering, the devil arrives in the guise of the historical figure, La Passionaria. Some people may fam be familiar with her. Dolores Ibaru, uh, known as La Passionaria, was a communist leader in the government of the Spanish Republic and a radio personality. So Alberti's play recounts the arrest and torture of two pious and bourge two pious bourgeois mother Spanish mothers and daughters living in Republican hell Barcelona. In the play, the Reds arrest the women for having objects of religious devotion in their homes. La, Passion La Passionaria sort of appears in their house through the walls in the shape-shifting guise of the devil. She catches them in the act of praying, finds the rosary, uh, which she calls the dark emblem of their superstition. She throws it to the ground and takes them to prison to await execution. Meanwhile, the family servant has been out and about and has seen what is going on, and she reports about the atrocities. When their bloody madness wants a more refined outlet, they crucify their victims or tie them to a tree by placing dynamite or rags soaked in flammable matter under their feet, to which they uh, apply fire. And fire burning is one of the through lines in this, uh, transforming the victims into human torches. Right. So a kind of inversion of the auto de fe uh, of the Inquisition. A lot of these ideas are kind of displacements of what actually had been done by the other side. In prison awaiting their deaths, the mother and daughter embrace their coming martyrdom. The daughter muses, we are living 
in these days as in the era of Christian persecution and the tragic hours of the catacombs. Her mother dies, quote, with her eyes shining with supernatural light and raised, uh, her, she raised her noble forehead towards the sky, at, which at that moment seemed to be radiating the crown of martyrdom around her head. The play is an assimilation of the conspiracy myth, uh, declaring one of their, one of the characters, uh, soon to be martyrs, declaring Satan has come incarnate in Spain and has been, the battle field has been chosen where the forces of the devil fight against those of God. This is a cover of a memoir I found in the archive that I'm not going to talk about, but I'm happy uh, at the reception to talk about it. Okay, with the invasion of the Soviet Union and the total war on the Eastern Front in June 1941, the conspiracy narratives circulating in Italy became ever more apocalyptic in their threat of a civilizational annihilation and subjugation. As fascist troops fought on the Eastern Front against fascism and Nazism's sworn enemy, the Soviet Union, Fascist propaganda proposed that the enemy was fast approaching the door of every Italian home and that the Reds had detailed plans for the destruction they would wreak when they got to Italy. Not surprisingly, war and increasingly losing war made existential enemies both more important to the fascist worldview and more critical that they constitute absolute threats. So here we have a postcard. This is the official postcard that soldiers could send from the front. They had a choice of a couple of them. Um, and here we have Europe against anti-Europe and the Madonna and child figure being protected, not just by an Italian soldier, but you see the helmet of a German soldier as well and the door being closed on the monsters and devils. And you see a little hammer and sickle at the feet of one of the monsters. Um, again, the propaganda produced during the Axis War against the Soviet Union flooded the public sphere uh, in a wide range of forms, from newspapers to feature films, um, to pamphlets, to books, to posters. Here's an example of one of the books. Again, the burning church and the idea of being against God. Increasingly, discourses around destruction of the family. Uh, this idea of the godless, Bolshevism uh, confesses this. Mario Parodi made a whole career around these kinds of publications. Um, I want to say a little bit about uh, the racial component here, right? This is the most famous racist magazine of the period, supported by the regime to prepare Italians for the race laws. And here we have the medieval blood libel being depicted, sucking the blood. Um, Jews sucking the blood of a Christian child. Um, and then this little image in the corner is the actual logo of the magazine, uh, Defense of the Race, and it shows the Roman gladium separating the Romans, the Italians, from Jews and Africans. Um, and then they did a special issue on Bolshevism stressing the enslavement that would come with an allied victory. So with the war in the Eastern Front and with the losses in late 1942, race-based conspiracy narratives moved to the core and really became an Italian version of Judeo-Bolshevism, stressing the barbarism of Asiatic Reds and their plotting manipulation and racial pollution of the Jews who controlled them. Connected to racial depictions, of a Soviet plot was the threat of replacement. And I think this has powerful contemporary resonances. As in contemporary replacement theories, fascist conspiracy myths of this period held that um, by stealing children and taking them to Russia for indoctrination and forced labor, good God-fearing Italians would be replaced by bloodthirsty communist automatons. As we saw during the Spanish Civil War, wartime conspiracy narratives mobilized deep-seated stereotypes about Russian lack of civilization, immutable biological flaws, and more recent post-1917 tropes 
about Bolshevik barbarism. Wartime representations offered a subhuman enemy from the East um, program for indiscriminate violence in pursuit of global subjugation. All Soviets, ran the myth, were racially identifiable from Lenin with his, quote, Mongolian profile to the Soviet foot soldier as the pamphlet, The Godless uh, Against the Family explained. The Bolshevik soldier was identified by his bulkiness, his high cheekbones, his high cheekbones, um, and his confused gaze. The Soviet book, the Bolshevik foot soldier was more animal than human, driven by instinct rather than intelligence or morality. The Soviet commissars, here's an image from a film I'm gonna talk briefly about. The idea was that the Soviet political commissars manipulated uh, the foot soldier, forcing him into battle. Fascist propaganda argued that these wily, cunning, but physically small political operatives controlled the Russian soldier. The commissar was coded and marked in standard and familiar anti-Semitic ways to imply that he or she, and there are depictions of women this way, uh, that he or she was a lesser race. So the character involved small stature, large nose, glasses, facial hair, unruly, and dark hair. According to the propaganda, these commissars uh, forced the disabled foot soldier into battle. In 1942, the year of the regime's greatest military defeats, a number of feature films uh, co-produced by friendly nations and also co-produced in Italy offered audiences embedded in kind of combat and romance films a vision of this conspiracy. One of them is this film, Odessa and Fiamme, released in 1942. Um, it was a co-production of the uh, Italian Cinema and the Romanian Ministry of Propaganda, directed by Carmine Gallone, who also had already made a career in sort of fascist propaganda films. It is set during the Soviet occupation of Bessarabia in the summer of 1940, and then during the reconquest uh, by the Romanian German forces in July 1941. The plot revolves around Maria, an opera star, a beloved opera star who likes Romanian folk music, but also Italian opera. The Soviet, of course, the, and she gets to sing a couple times in the film. The Soviet invasion separates Maria from her family, and she's caught under Bolshevik rule. Um, when Maria returns to Odessa, she finds her house pillaged and graffitiing again with hammers and sickles, black cars picking people from their homes and executing them. We see a man shot for praying, and her son has been kidnapped. So in a, co a core plot twist that makes very little sense, Maria's former manager is now a Soviet commissar, and she goes to him to ask for the release of her son, and he responds, Nico is now property of the state, and that all the children are now known by numbers rather than names. He forces her to sign a false oath, you know, again, the theme of the devil, and false oaths, and that he would show her where her son is if she sang for the, uh, the Red Army. At the end of the film, the allies, the, al the Axis liberators arrive, the boys are rescued from the catacombs, families are reunited, a, collect a collective baptism takes place, the Red Star is pulled down, and uh, everyone is happy. Uh, you know, it's this moment before things turn very bad. The Italian feature film to most explicitly represent the, a Judeo, an Italian version of the Judeo-Bolshevik conspiracy is Roberto Rossellini's Uomo dalla Croce, set on the Eastern Front in 1942. How many people have seen Rome Open City? Okay, well, this is going to be shocking because this is the inverse. Uh, in this film, after an attack by the Red Army, one of the wounded Italian soldiers cannot be moved and the chaplain, who actually plays the chaplain in the end scene of Rome Open City, remains uh, behind to nurse him. How many people have seen Man of the Cross? Okay, one, okay. So the following day, the Red Army captures the chaplain and the wounded soldier. In a scene that we're about to see, but 
is only in Italian, so I'm going to say a little bit about it. Uh, the Soviets capture the priest and the Italian soldier. In a schoolhouse adorned with a painting of Stalin and a drawing of a naked woman, so markers of political and sexual deviance, the political commissar interrogates the chaplain. The commissar is filthy, unshaven, bandaged, scratching himself. He grabs uh, the chaplain's crucifix, taunting him, saying he is a sorcerer, a conjurer of the dead, a Catholic witch doctor. In response to the dirty and scratching commissar, one of the Soviet soldiers jokes, have him exercise you. Maybe it will cure your eczema. The commissar, as we will say, see, bears all the, the sort of standard stereotypes um, about Jews and, and Russians. Um, I, think, I think we are ready to turn to the clip. Stefano? Think, watch carefully the part where the chaplain and the commissar are in profile uh, talking to each other. Stefano, grazie. Di sterminare tutti i nemici dell'idea comunista. A meno che tu non preferisca a più rare. Vuoi chiamare qui? Io non firmo niente. No? Ok, well, it, it is on Amazon if, if you want to see the rest. But I think all of the sort of themes I've been talking about are sort of embedded in that scene. Uh, and you know, interesting questions about Rossellini's career uh, for another for another time. Can, can we go back to the PowerPoint? Okay. So during the Nazi occupation of Italy and the fascist puppet regime, 
which began in September 1943, the Republic of Selo, depictions of subhuman Bolsheviks and their child-stealing conspiracy reached a crescendo. See? Echo. Oh, okay. So this is from the film, the poster from the film, and then this was the opening uh, statement about the film that sets it up. And here he is ministering. Okay. Um, this is a newspaper article from December 1943, beginning in December 1943. So at this point, Italy is divided south of Rome, occupied by the Nazis and the puppet regime below the Allies. So a newspaper uh, series began sort of constantly in December, January, February, uh, 43 into 44, after the fall of both the African and Eastern fronts, reporting the forced deportation of 40,000 Italian children from allied uh, occupied Italy, from Southern Italy, where these articles said they would be brainwashed never to see their families again. Now, since communication between Nazi-occupied Italy and the South had broken down, this is being, the, the Italians in the occupied part of Italy are being barraged with this. They don't know whether it's true or not. And then there's a lot of stories, firsthand reports of what's being done to these children in these camps to encourage people to fight to, to the bitter end, obviously. Um, and then you get this series of posters put up in Italian cities in 1944, right? So stolen from their mothers. And then look at the, so we have the British soldier sort of depicted as goofy and effeminate, and this Red Army soldier, again, as kind of, um, you know, disabled, physically brutal, stealing the children from the mother's very arms. This is the same poster from the period. Uh, Stalin himself is coming to steal the children. There are even accusations of cannibalism in some of these articles, and then that the children will be taken, they will be starved, um, and that even if you try to find them, it will not be possible. Okay, I am gonna jump to the present. <sighs> Despite the particular context of total war and dictatorship, there is much in these conspiracy theories that is familiar and universal. There is the anxiety over replacement by different moral and social code by a racial other. There is fear for the safety of children, um, that some powerful outside or internal force will come and take them. There is the rationale that the enemy is not fully human, a carrier of disease, and therefore not able to act within the bounds of civilization and therefore must be destroyed in order to save the nation. So something to chew on. Uh, this is a quote from a recent speech. And then some, some headlines. Okay, with that, thank you all. <laughs> I'm happy to take questions. Hi, Laura. Yes, or possibly colonial troops, possibly Australian. Possibly. I don't know, anybody who knows uniforms out there? Yeah. I, I don't know the, it could be really Yeah, but you know, there is, I, I didn't talk about it here, but there is a whole anti-British and anti-American propaganda, and the Brits are always depicted, as Laura says, as kind of children, as kind of goofy, as silly.
Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 There's a film Benghazi about uh, empire uh, from 1940. Also has that 42 has that depiction of British forces. Stuart. Yeah, that's a great question, right? There are these kind of, this appears. Oh. Yeah, great question. I mean, we've seen footage, footage of Ukrainian children being returned. Um, I'm not an authority, but I guess it is to a certain extent true. I think the numbers have been exaggerated for this, you know, sort of propaganda. The the right. Well, people, you know, I think it has happened in war, right? right. Yeah. Hilaria. Sure. Well, I don't know if it's just children in the fascist time. I think it's the notion, you know, the centrality of the Italian family. So as the regime was losing the war, all of the propaganda really became about the Italian family. They didn't have anything positive to sell, like the new world, you know, new fascist order or the glories of fascist empire. It became all about protecting the family. In an, to get people at their most visceral, right? To get them at their deepest fears. So I, I think the children thing is not particularly specific to the fascist period as much as it is to Italian culture. Um, but you know, the fascists certainly regimented children, and you, you had children in, in their in their sphere. Oh, sure. Um, thank you for that talk. I, I just wanted to, could you say a little bit more about the Catholic imagery and the fascist propaganda? I always thought there was a tension there with the fascists, yes. and then, but they clearly are using that imagery. Yeah, well again, so the question was about the fascist use of Catholic imagery and discourse. The fascists were really good politicians, right? You know, the Lateran Pacts, brought the church back to Italy and made it possible to be a good fascist and a good Catholic. And the regime knew, again, what would speak to people. Uh, all the propaganda that I showed was supported also by the church. The Spanish Civil War, Italian intervention on the side of Franco was completely supported by the church. I could show you a whole series of church pamphlets, books, uh, making the same arguments that the fascists were making. So it was a way to bring people along. It was an imagery that spoke to people in a deep way. Um, I would love to talk to some uh, people who work on Catholic imagery and on, uh, on the medieval period, because you know this stuff around devils, and I need to, de de to develop that a little bit more, and the idea that devils for force false oaths. Chris is going to yeah. answer all my questions. I, I, have no, I have no answer to that, unfortunately. Um, I was actually wondering to what degree that there, is there any um, continuity in the post-war period with these conspiracy theories? Do you see them showing up again of if you elect leftists, if you elect communists? Oh my God, did I happen? plant that question? <laughs> so the film Man of the Cross was shown it was put in mobile cinema wagons by the Comitati Civici, uh, the Catholic Action uh, Committees, and it was driven around southern Italy. You know, it wouldn't have gone over well in the north where there was a very powerful Communist Party with eight minutes of film cut out. So it was absolutely used. Uh, the posters, uh, I wish I had examples in my PowerPoint, many of the posters of the post-war period had very similar aesthetic. Uh, that Stalin is going to come and steal your children if the left wins in 1948.
But there was a really a wide circulation of these films, not just Man of the Cross, a film called Siege of the Alcazar uh, that is about the uh, Republican siege of the nationalist forces in Toledo. That is mobilized for the 1948 election, again, with about four minutes of film where people are making the fascist salute. So absolutely, this propaganda uh, is recycled and circulated because in a way it works, right? If you want to scare people into a certain position or into a certain vote, uh, I think it works. Any other questions? Oh yes, and questions from the Zoom audience? And I'm sorry the Zoom audience couldn't see the film, I think. Elisa, do you want to read a Zoom question? So, from the Zoom, um, what are the what are the connections with the modern day? You hint at what is happening now with the twenty twenty four elections. There have been questions about Ukraine. How do we negotiate this for future conversations on politics? Great question. Well, oh, so the, yes, so everyone, could people hear the question? Yeah. Um, I think this dehumanization of the enemy is what happens when you're sort of, when a democracy is in decline. So instead of making an argument, vote this way or that way because of policy or programs, the argument becomes, we've got an existential threat. Be it at the border, you know, we all know how the border is being instrumentalized and how immigrants have been depicted in the United States and here and in Europe as well as other, as not like us, as this has happened in Italy as too, as carrying disease. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, I think I, I do mean it as a sort of a warning about what kind of political language is being used uh, and instrumentalized for sure. Um, thanks, Marla, for the really interesting talk. I was struck by some of your imagery because, and I'm going to ask a global dimension question, because just a couple of years later in Southeast Asia and Vietnam, similar imagery is used by what later becomes the Communist Party to suggest that um, the French, who at one, at several points, were uh, French colonial officials, many of whom were Jewish. They used similar imagery to suggest that Jews and uh, Jewish representatives of the French in Indochina will bake your children and turn them into Africans. Wow. But similar, and they will steal your children and put them into, and a colleague of mine at George Washington University works in this, and turn them into Africans. So I was wondering, and so, so this, and this is used by the communists. By the communists. To mobilize people yes. against the French. Against the French, but then they, you, they specifically point to Jewish representatives of the French uh, universities and administration. So I was wondering if you could speak so that speak a little bit to the kind of global dimensions yeah. of these wow, conspiracy that's theories. Fascinating. I, I would love to, to see some of that. Um, well, it certainly speaks to the universality of anti-Semitism, right? That, you know, Jews are be able to be used as a specter for whatever political direction uh, is wanted. I, I, I find that fascinating. That, so that the French imperialists were supposed to all be Jews in, in that reading? Right, it has an incredible staying power. So in California, about a year and a half ago, uh, flyers were putting, being put into Ziploc bags and the fly, and with pebbles in them, and actually one landed in my driveway in Los Angeles, I wasn't there, uh, and the, the flyer said, COVID is a Jewish hoax. And then it listed the people at the CDC, Rochelle Walensky, and it would say Jewish, and this other official would say Jewish, and then it would say Anthony Fauci, lover of the Jews. <laughs> um, 
And this was the kind of list that anti-communists used in the interwar period and would publish, you know, arguing that the Soviet leadership uh, was Jewish, so they would sort of say this one, this one, this one, or this one is a friend of the Jews. Um, at least another question. Question from the Zoom. Um, did the term polarization have an equivalent at the time? And I'm particularly interested in the way the use of the term polarized today creates a false equivalency between ideological concerns based in reality and those divorced from, from it, such as QAnon, et cetera. Mm. Great question. So asking if there was similar polarization? The term polarization. Uh, no, I don't, I don't think so. Um, you know, the people against it were anti-fascist, and by this point, they were either abroad or in hiding. And then also, of course, by the time of the Civil War, uh, starting September 1943, you know, there was armed resistance in the North. Um, so I, I'm not sure, I've never seen the word polarization used for this, this period. Any concluding question? There are two that I'm going to combine together. One that is very difficult. Any thoughts on conspiracy theories in relation to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? Oh, and well, then, no. <laughs> which is connected to the last question. Yeah. Can you talk about why people believe these conspiracy theories of hate when they know what they might be reading is wrong? Is it a part of human nature to believe things that are not true? Mm, fascinating question. <laughs> Well, I think it's human nature when we're scared to attach it to some unfamiliar other, right? It's got to be the fault of this group or this people and their, you know, and that our very existence will be threatened. Um, I think that's the power of conspiracy theories. And then, of course, as I was saying, particularly if they're coming from above and below, if they're produced by different vectors in society. So if you see it in the newspaper and then you see it hinted at in a film and, you know, then your friend is talking about it, um, it, it can take on a kind of veracity. I, I have to tell another anecdote. Uh, for the last American presidential election, I was an election monitor in Arizona for the Democratic Party, and I was standing outside a polling station uh, in Tucson, and a woman came up with a T-shirt. Um, I don't think she could possibly be on the Zoom, and it had Smokey the Bear, and then it said, only you can stop communism, vote Trump. So I said, oh, I'm, I'm interested in that. You know, Where'd you get the T-shirt? She said, oh, online. And then she said, I can send you the link and I said, that's okay. And then she, she, she asked me where I was from, and I said, California. She said, oh, I'm going to send you another link because Gavin Newsom, the governor of California, just passed a law allowing men to have sex with underage children so that he could raise electricity rates. <laughs> and she wanted, she wanted, she was grabbing for my phone. I'm like, no, that's okay. Um, but right, it seems absurd to us. She believed it. Um, the other part of the question, yes, I'm sure the Israel-Palestinian conflict is producing conspiracy theories. I'm, I'm not aware of any. Um, I am aware of being heartbroken by the whole thing. I will say that. Should we conclude on that not very <laughs> happy note? It may not be a happy note, but I would also say that Marla, in her history, is also an amazing advocate, an ally, and a co-conspirator. And that is the other part of her identity, is not only as a historian, but as an activist. And so we are very grateful to you for your inspiration. Please join us upstairs for an aperitivo. And if you would also join Marla in the billiards room, there's a little surprise up where the portraits are because Marla has never had a portrait hung before, and our incredible program staff have actually installed a portrait for you so that you will always look over all of us at the American Academy. Thank you.